Okay, welcome back to uh, Unit 3, our discussion of sculpture. This is the second part of the lecture on sculpture. And when I was last talking about this, I was explaining about counter-relief. And I think I covered counter-relief pretty clearly, but there was a little bit more I wanted to say about sunken relief. Sunken relief was a style of sculpture that was mostly used in Egypt and mostly used for a very specific purpose when there were really large reliefs on the sides of buildings like monumental scale type reliefs and it was a it was a time saving um, mechanism by which instead of having to carve the negative space down you know let's say eight inches deeper all the way all around the whole thing instead the sculptors would just carve the contour line edge of the figure really really deep maybe about eight or nine inches and then round the figure within those two carved trenches and so it get, creates a kind of odd unreal sort of feel where the figures look both flat and dimensional simultaneously and a little bit of a yeah just kind of like almost like a, a a flip version of, of value in places like you get dark edges places where you think you're going to get a light edge but the other thing i want to say is that this particular piece though is from the amarna period you know akhenaten with his uh, queen nefertiti and they and in this particular case the sculptors are using sunken relief in a situation in a context where normally uh, Egyptian artists would never use it. It's a much smaller, intimate scale. It's a family scene. It's not a big historical um, documentation of an event on the side of a, of a building. And that's kind of representative of how unusual uh, the Amarna period was in some ways in relation to all of uh, Egyptian art and that they were doing something so, um, using a, a form that was normally for a completely different context. Okay, so and we were just briefly talking about low relief and high relief and the opposite of relief is freestanding and I want to cover a little bit some of these different kind of um, issues because there can be a little bit confusing right freestanding means that the sculpture stands on its own so all relief sculptures automatically not freestanding even if the, the high relief sculpture is very very dimensional as long as it's attached to a back wall, it's not freestanding. But you can have freestanding sculptures that are not particularly in the round, and we'll talk about that. And you can even more rarely have examples of sculptures that are not truly freestanding, but are in the round. And so here, this uh, Well of Moses by Klaus Sluter is a good example of that, where we have a sculpture that is definitely in the round because we can walk around this column Right, all the way around it, and we can see the figures, you know, in all all different directions. But at the same time, because all four of the figures are attached to a column that, you know, then in the well, then therefore they are um, they're not truly freestanding because they're attached to the architecture. Whereas these two sculptures, like this one, especially the Egyptian one, uh, is especially a good, good example of a work that is freestanding but not really in the round. It's not in the round because if you walk around to the back side of it, it will be completely flat and with no, um, no uh, carving whatsoever, no information about the backs of the figures because it has really one preferred point of view and that's it. Um, so when we talk about in the round, and sometimes sculptors like to talk about in the round versus fully in the round, one of the ways that they get at this point is that fully in the round is when Right in the round is when the whole sculpture has been dealt with all the way around. So there's no blank parts to it. You can walk all the way around it and you can see it all the way around. Fully in the round is when every view is equally important. And here's a good kind of comparison to give you an understanding of that difference, right? Michelangelo's David is freestanding and it's in the round. It's in the round because when you walk around it, every part is complete, it's finished, right? Um, but it's not fully in the round because it really has some some definite preferred vantage points, places for you that you're intended to look at it from. Most importantly, there's this view that we're looking at it right here, but also the view as we walk up to it when we're walking towards it and David is looking above us, looking down, right, staring us down as we walk up to it. 
Um, and those are the two most important views. Whereas the backside of him is, you know, it's a nice view, but it's not nearly as as dramatic or interesting. Now, if we compare that to um, uh, uh, to Bernini's David, right? Here we have a sculpture that is much more interested in all of the space around it. And when you come up to it, you have to, you really feel compelled to walk all the way around it and see every angle because every different change transforms the sculpture. Every couple of steps you move to one side or to another completely changes your view and gives you a whole new insight into what's going on in the sculpture. What's also interesting about it is how it creates this sense of like, wrapping negative spaces twisting around him it's like he becomes this spiral of positive and negative volumes and negative space is the next thing i'm going to talk about so i think i think that um in this lecture one of the things i wanted to emphasize is the importance of negative volume and i think that that really does come out of this tradition going back to baroque sculpture like bernini and for many sculptors, um, kind of like thinking about positive and negative volume equally is almost is a very important kind of starting point to making a work of sculpture. I think no sculptor represents that better than maybe Henry Moore, where his pieces are so inviting for us to come and enjoy those internal negative spaces and internal negative volumes. So for the rest of the lecture, we're just going to talk a little bit about kind of expanding the definition of sculpture, looking at some 20th century and then into contemporary sculpture. And on this page, just want you to think about, we talked about Alexander Calder's acrobats um, piece before, where I talked about them in terms of um, drawing, thinking of them as a drawing that expands the definition of drawing by turning a drawing into a sculpture. But you could also flip it the other way and say it's, a work of sculpture that's expanding the definition of sculpture by turning a sculpture into a drawing. But you could see other artists here, such as uh, Picasso, where he's using found objects and just assembling, you know, a bicycle uh, seat and a bicycle uh, handlebars to create a bull head. And, you know, or um, here we have Joseph Boys, where what he's doing is basically just wrapping a piano in felt and turning that into a work of sculpture. Each of these are kind of unusual, new kind of ways of approaching what is a sculpture. And when we look at the minimalist work of the 60s and the 70s, they're also kind of pushing the boundaries of what is a sculpture by pushing the boundaries of like, how minimal can a sculpture be? How little can it say? But also how much like architecture can a work of sculpture be? And I think with Richard Serra, it's very definite, like it, the only way to experience many of his biggest works is to walk through them and into them. And so they have to be explored as like they were a work of architecture. And if a sculpture can only be, you know, enjoyed and explored like a work of sculpture, is it more sculpture than, than or is it more architecture than sculpture? That's a interesting thing to think about. So the next artists that we have to look at are Jeff Koons, I'm not going to say too much because I'm going to talk about Jeff Koons a little bit more in some other lectures, um, and Tom Friedman. And the one thing, I really love Tom Friedman's work, but the one thing I want to talk about right here is the total box, because I just think it's such a brilliant uh, piece. He's a very, very smart sculptor, and I love this piece where it so looks like we're looking at a pixelated photograph of a total box, but instead we're looking at a non-pixelated photograph of a pixelated box. The box itself is pixelated because he's made a total box by cutting up hundreds of total boxes and cutting them into small little squares and then rebuilding them together to make a pixelated total box. And lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Rachel White Reed. Um, there's so much I could say she's one of my favorite artists, but I, the main thing I want to say is that she is kind of in a continuation of this tradition of thinking of negative space, right? And the interaction between positive and negative as a fundamental idea in sculpture. And the way the spin that she took on that was to actually cast actual real life negative spaces of familiar places and then make the negative, the, the negative space into a positive. So like in this case in house, it is an internal cast of a brownstone house. So it's a cast of that whole space. It's pretty amazing. All right, thank you very much. See you on the next lecture.